Hey, everybody, and welcome to a special episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast, where we interview the winner of the Unbound XL, the men's race, Taylor Ledeen. This is actually a successful athletes podcast episode, but we think it's a really special one to feature considering the race just happened and it's such a big feat. And we wanted to share it with you. Uh, Taylor is a regular podcast listener, and we can learn a lot from what he did in this race as well as his insights into the balance of mental health and endurance sport. Uh, he's been public with his struggles with that, particularly over the past year. And I just found this episode to be so awesome. So I'm really excited to share it with everybody here on the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast feed as well. So without further ado, please enjoy this successful athletes podcast episode with Unbound XL winner, rider for Pivot, Stands, and Shimano, Taylor Ledeen. Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast presented by Trainer Road, where we interview successful athletes to make you a faster cyclist. This week, we are joined with by Taylor Ledeen out of Arizona. He rides for Pivot Cycles, Stands, and Shimano, and he's an ultra endurance racer and also a friend of mine. I'm just super excited to have you on here, Taylor. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Jonathan. I appreciate you having me on here. Um, I'm a big fan of Trainer Road. Like I told you before, I listened every Thursday for my rides. I'm, I'm super excited. I have good, good content to start my ride with. <laughs> That's awesome, man. It's good to, it's, I always uh, joke around on the podcast that, you know, like we'll, we'll be talking about like Peter Sagan or something. I'll be like, yeah, and he's listening right now, just joking around, <laughs> you know, but it's cool to know that we have, uh, such athletes as you listening and, and we're going to cover recently a huge achievement. You just won unbound XL. Uh, mm -hmm. can you tell us what unbound XL is? And then we'll go into your preparation for the event and go through the whole thing. Um, but also, and sorry, this is a terrible question. This is like podcast one one and I'm ruining it, but, um, I don't want to bury the lead here. We're going to spend a significant amount of this podcast too, talking about the intersection of endurance sport and mental health. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's something that merits probably a whole lot more discussion than exists. Mm -hmm. So, yep. um, and, and also, and if anybody's listening to this now, there's a fantastic piece. First of all, you should follow Taylor on Instagram, T Ledeen, his last name. Uh, but then you can also, there's a great piece in beta, beta MTB. They're the online publication and print magazine. They did a fantastic piece on you as well, um, that people can go, uh, check out. We'll also have a piece on our blog for this as well, that will go into more of your background. Uh, Sean, one of our awesome copywriters is working on that. So with all that said, let's talk about unbound XL. What is it? Yeah. So unbound, um, is an awesome gravel race that happens in Emporia, Kansas. Um, what's really cool about the event, in my opinion, is there's something for everybody there. They have a 25 miler, a 50 miler, a hundred, the more premier event, which is the 200 in terms of the amount of participants. <laughs> and then within the past three years, I, I believe it is, they introduced what's called the Unbound XL. Um, that is a little bit different in the sense that it's a fully self-supported race. Um, and that one starts on Friday before the 100 and 200. So being that it's a fully self-supported event, uh, it's a bit longer than 200, obviously. So I did hold on here. <laughs> ideally, how long is it? <laughs> yeah. So, um, this year was just over 350 miles. Um, being that it's, like I said, fully self-supported, you have to be strategic in the sense of you go through these little remote towns of Kansas and some of those towns may, their gas stations may be only open until midnight or three in the morning. So you really have to plan out your route, um, and your pacing and everything like that to make sure you hit these resupply points, because as everybody knows, Kansas this time of year can be hot and humid. And if you run out of water out there, you can find yourself in a bad way. So this is like f almost 575 kilometers for those. <laughs> so for those listening across the pond, this is a huge, like huge, huge. And I can actually call it a day because of the hours in which you finished it in. But this is a huge undertaking. You have to navigate yourself, right? Like there's a course, but there are no course markings. Is that correct? You're the one that has to follow the route that you put on your GPS. Yeah, correct. So they released the the course, ju just as they do every other course. Um, and it's your responsibility to upload it on your GPS and be able to navigate properly. So that can be a little stressful. You have to make sure you do your homework on that. But yeah, being that it's 350 miles, I think people assume that everybody that signs up for this, they know they can do 350 miles. And I just want people to know that 
these long races are incredibly daunting to, to me as well. Before every start of these, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> like, it just <laughs> seems so terrifying. Um, but you break it down, right? It's like this big adventure on a bike rather than this quote unquote race. And I like to think of it that way rather than a race. Yeah. So this is, uh, we were joking around actually in a group chat with this, that you actually, this was really easy for you. Cause it was only 22 hours cause it wasn't 24 hours. Cause you do 24 hour racing of uh, 24 hour mountain biking is really kind of like your niche, like your specialty and what you focus on, but yeah. you were able to do this in 22 hours. Is that correct? Yeah. Just under 23 hours. Um, Holy so cow. it was a long day on the bike and it's no matter how, no matter what you do out there, it's just tough. And it's like, if you, I don't, I don't really care what discipline you're doing out there. If you're doing the 50, the hundred, 200 or XL, like it's tough. Like those conditions out there are super, super tough. The wind is harsh. The elements are harsh. The rocks are sharp as ever. Uh, so yeah, it's just this, it's a, it's a mental battle regardless of what discipline you're doing out there. Yeah. How did you prepare for this? So, and this may you know, as a caveat to this, this is kind of your, in terms of the longer stuff is what you train for regularly. So you weren't going from being like a crit racer to suddenly having to flip the script, Mm -hmm. but still, how did you train for, for unbound XL? Yeah. So it was, I had a little different training leading into this event. Um, my main focus this year was a 24 hour race in Tucson called 24 hours in the old Pueblo in February. Um, unfortunately that was canceled just like many races have been the past 12 months. So that was really the primary focus. And once that was canceled, I was, I was pretty let down. So I kind of had this pity party for a few days or a week, didn't ride my bike much, um, just kind of reset. And then I had set my focus on this personal challenge called the Arizona trail 300. Um, being that it's local to Arizona, I figured perfect timing, right? We had, we hadn't had much snow this winter. So the higher elevations were pretty much dry. So that was my main focus. And unfortunately I had a pretty serious crash in March right before about the week before I was supposed to do this Arizona trail. Um, so that really set things back. I spent a day in the hospital, had some surgery and the worst thing. And the thing that really held me back was the concussion. So I really had to kind of adjust my plans and being that that happened in March and unbound happens the first weekend in June, I thought oh, I can take, take time here to recover and then hopefully just have some fitness and mental capacity at that point to line up at unbound. And, uh, so recovering from the crash was a bit of a process, uh, both physically and mentally, but slowly, but surely I was able to kind of get back out there and focus on these longer rides, which I really enjoy doing, um, people assume that I ride way more than I actually do. They assume that if you're doing these 24 hour races, oh, you're riding eight, 10, 12 hours at a time. Sometimes that couldn't be further from the truth for me personally, for me, that's counterproductive. Uh, I want to enjoy the bike when I'm out there. I don't want it to be this thing where I finish a ride and I'm like, oh, I'm just so, so trash. I can't think about riding the next day. And yeah, you have these, these blocks where you do need to ride with fatigue in the legs. Uh, but it's not regularly for me, The the biggest block I did for this was three, six hour days in a row. That's the most, um, most weeks were anywhere from 15 to 25 hours, which 25 hours. I definitely feel that for me personally, larger volume, isn't necessarily the key. It's more about mm. quality and nutrition and trying to focus on recovery. And that seems to be the golden ticket for myself. This, uh, let's focus on those three aspects. <clears throat> I think that's a great point. Now, what do you mean in terms of quality? What's a, what is the quality work that you try to get in for these long events? So my coach, Linda Wallenfels, <clears throat> most of the time, Monday through Friday is more focused on intensity. Uh, and we can, I can get a lot of intensity in any ride from anywhere for an hour and a half to three hours, sometimes four hours, all power and heart rate based. And then the weekends are typically focused around longer rides zone two endurance. Like everybody knows you just go out there, you focus on eating. You're not really, it's not too structured. 
But I really enjoy that too, because it, it changes things up. Monday through Friday is exciting. It's intense, which I really struggle with personally. Uh, and then, yeah, I really kind of go into my element on those long rides during the weekend. Do you find yourself doing, cause there's a common assumption out there that it's like, well, these are long events, <clears throat> so you're not going to be riding at VO2 and anaerobic and that sort of stuff. So do you do any like intensity when I, and when I say high intensity, I mean, above the threshold and above, do you do a lot of that work at all? I do. It's not super common for me. Uh, usually how it works is I do this big base block. And then in about the, about the month leading into a large event, I taper down on the volume and I focus on things like 30 by thirties or four by fours at VO2. Those to me are the most painful thing I can imagine doing. And I know, <laughs> I know it's painful for everybody, but for, for me, it's just this, it's fun, but at the same time, it's the most dreaded 30 seconds or four minutes I can possibly imagine just because it's something I don't work on regularly. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's, I look forward to the change up with that. Yeah, for sure. And, and yeah, four minute VO two intervals. Oh my gosh. They're so hard. <laughs> Cause if you, it's weird, I, this, and this may be individual, but a lot of the time when you extend that VO two longer into like five, six minutes, yep. and then like, really, once you start getting into like eight minutes, those are, those are really long, but it almost gets easier. You have like a weird in between point because the intensity just can't be quite as high. Mm -hmm. The four minute part, you can go really, really hard and just hold that. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so brutal. It's so funny how in a four minute VO two effort, the amount of conversations you have with yourself within four minutes, you know? it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You go yeah, to like, man, it's awesome. You start out in a very positive mind in a headspace, And then all of a sudden at a minute 30, like, I, I just can't, I can't hold on to this any longer, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And then you somehow, you like, you get to a minute and a half in and you think, well, if I feel like this, there's no way I can do more than twice what I just did yeah. yet. Somehow you get to three minutes and then you're like, okay, I only have one minute left and I think I can do it somehow. Like yeah. it's, it's incredible. Then that last 30 seconds is just, is absolute suffering. We as yeah, cyclists the tail a, of the VO2. We have a good short term memory, I guess, because we finished that four <laughs> minutes and then you recover and you're like, eh, I gotta, guess I gotta try it again here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know? exactly. Yeah. What about nutrition? So how do you train? Uh, first of all, do you have a nutrition goal that you try to take in like grams of carbs per hour? And then do you try to work backwards in that in your training or how do you lay out nutrition for such huge events? For me, it's about training the gut. Uh, so early in the season before any big event, I'll go out and do long rides and I will focus. I don't focus on grams per, of carbs per hour, but more just calories per hour. So if I'm starting a big block for, let's say a 24 hour solo mountain bike race, the first month is really rough on my gut because I'm, like I said, I'm having to train my gut to break this nutrition down while I'm riding. So I have a lot of like GI discomfort during and after rides particularly, but the more I, I work on that, the more I practice fueling regularly throughout these rides, the easier it gets. And it's not the most fun thing to get used to because everybody's been there where you're on the bike and it's either hot out and you just, nothing sounds good. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I do a lot of liquid nutrition on the bike because for me, it's a quick, efficient way of getting calories in. I have found for me personally, between three and 400 calories per hour is perfect. Anything less. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't feel fueled enough. Anything more can cause some major G GI distress. So, so that's around 70 to hundred grams of carbs that you're taking in. If you're taking it in like through a mix, because mix are almost predominantly carbs. Yeah. Yeah. So I do infinite nutrition. Um, sweet. So I add a little bit of protein in there when I do my custom blend, because for me, that kind of curbs the hunger a little bit. Mm. I don't do too much protein though. Cause that kind of can be a gut bomb at times, but yeah, pretty high. on. Do you carbs. do the protein in like form of BCAAs or do you do it in form of like a whey or plant-based protein? Both. Okay, yep. cool. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So then you spend that time taking it in. Um, th these are long events. So you usually end up having like a hydration pack and you have bottles on your frame as well. And you ride a pivot Mach 4 SL, I would assume. On or the, the mountain bike less, side. Yep. Right? Yep. And what did you ride for DK? I rode the Pivot Vault. Or sorry, Unbound, I should say. Yeah, Unbound <laughs> Gravel. Yeah, so I rode yeah. the Pivot Vault, the gravel bike. 
I went with a pretty untraditional setup, honestly. Uh, that was one thing I really, really, really wanted to pay attention to was my gear select gear choice. Everything yeah. from tire selection to the bags I was running to the, the amount of calories I could bring on the bike because I didn't have a goal of winning the race at all. My goal, plain and simple, was to finish and finish happy and healthy. That was my only goal out there. And I knew to do that, I needed to check all the boxes in terms of a bike that was efficient, a bike that was reliable, and a way that I could stay fueled from start to finish. So mm -hmm. I, I started with a pretty heavy setup. I would guess probably the heaviest setup, <laughs> <laughs> but I did that for a reason. And, uh, I started with 8,000 calories that I brought with me on the wow. bike. So I did a full frame bag. I didn't have any bottles on the bike. I did a 85 ounce bladder in the frame bag and a 50 ounce bladder on my back. So I was carrying quite a bit of weight. Um, but to me, that was almost this incentive of eating the calories that I had on the bike because I'd be burning that fuel, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was yeah, kind of like jettisoning weight, right? As exactly. you're going along and it's only making you faster. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it was, I had spent a lot of time training on the bike too. Even when I was doing those like 30 by thirties and a couple of weeks leading up to the event, it looked really silly because I was doing it on our local climb on the road with this fully packed down bike with bags and lights and everything in the middle of the day. But to, for me, it was like, I might as well get used to how the bike handles fully weighted down. There's nothing better than training on the bike. You're going to race on. Mm. Yeah. That level of specificity has got to be super important because your bike probably handled substantially differently totally. than when it was unloaded. Right. Totally. And you got to, you need to run different tire pressure and everything like that. So I definitely didn't want to show up and have to guess on tire pressure because the bike was weighted down more. What tires did you run? That's such a huge topic of conversation at Unbound because of those, those crazy sharp rocks. Yeah, it's, that is probably the biggest conversation out there. Uh, I ran the Maxxis Ramblers and I was very, very picky. I wanted to run the 60 TPIs because everything is so sharp out there. Uh, with the silk shield. So, uh, I actually opted to run tire inserts front and rear this go around as well. And I brought Sorry. probably a dozen stands, dart plugs with me that were within reach <laughs> at all times. <laughs> Smart. Yeah. So the, uh, the tire choice now, when you say 60 TPI, a lot of mountain bike tires tend to be somewhere around 120 TPI or 60 to 120, mm -hmm. the lower that number, the less fabric it has and the more rubber it has. So it doesn't roll as well, but it's much more protective against flats. Yep. And you'll see like really high end exclusive mountain bike tires that I'm so frustrated that those average Joe's can't get like 170 TPI really that that's all that's very little rubber and just a lot of fabric and it rolls really fast, but it'll tear if you look at it wrong. Yeah. So in this case, you really erred on that side. You wanted to be really tough in that silk, uh, silk worm, I think it's called, right? Is silk shield. Said? Silk shield. Yep. That's like uh sidewalls and the casing. Everything has an additional layer of protection, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I actually brought a spare tire with me too, not just spare tubes. Wow. I brought a full spare tire. Where did you pack that? Uh, that was hilarious. So about a half hour before the start, Mary and I, I, I kind of freaked myself out and I, I was going back on my decision to carry a tire. And in 2019, I started the XL and had to put the spare tire on about 20 miles in and I was getting ready to ditch the tire out of the bottom of the frame bag closer to the bottom bracket. So trying to keep that really low mm -hmm. and Mary, my wife saw me doing that and she's like, nope, you are not doing that. We are going to spend the time now to make sure this fits. And I'm so happy that we did that. Did you end up using it? I ended up using that tire in the middle of the night. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the, the Flint rocks out there are on a nut. They're just, it's something like I've never seen before. It's absolutely mm. ridiculous. And it really requires this paying, paying attention to line choice and just trying to be light on the bike. But inevitably, everybody faces adversity out there, whether it's in the form of flat tires, other mechanicals, issues with the body, fueling, everything. So I just wanted to bring everything in case, worst case scenario. 
So when you run inserts in there, were you running pretty low pressure because of the inserts or what was your plan there? Cause a lot of the time people think that lower pressure would be easier to flat, but it actually could be the opposite. What did you end up running? I ran slightly higher pressure because I, my bike was weighed down so much with <clears throat> mm. fuel, both liquid and solid food. So I ran 36 in the rear, 34 in the front, which is a lot higher than I normally run and a little harsh, but mm. the pivot vault has a, a damper in the seat, seat tube. Also, I was running a redshift suspension seat post and a redshift oh, suspension smart. stem. Uh, smart. And, and I couldn't have been happier with the selection on all that. Yeah. Those, those are the, they, they have built in compliance into that seat post and that stem, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I run <clears throat> The isoflex on the frame has a little give because there's a durometer in there already, which is super comfortable, even if you run a rigid post. But the seat post and the stem, what's really cool about those is you can change the compression on them. They're, this, the stem basically runs on durometers. So I run the heaviest durometers possible as if I weighed like 250 pounds. So it only really takes the hard hit away. It's not really sagging or anything. And the seat post, the same thing. I turn the seat post in all of the way. So it just takes that edge off, which I was very grateful to have out there. Oh, I bet after 22 hours of that, yikes. Yeah. Um, it, going back to the tires, did you run forties or 45s or what, what size? Forties. Yep. Forties. Yeah. Perfect. And then did you run Stan's race sealant or did you run the standard sealant? We ran standard sealant for this one. And I also brought a spare tube of sealant with me. Smart. Yep. Just in case. Cause yeah, if you get a big flat and a ton leaks out, then you're, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, no backup plan anymore. <laughs> yeah. And before the race, um, Kenny, Wen, who works for stands lives, we only live about 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes apart. And we were really, really specific on the choice, the wheel choice that I was going to run for this event. And that's why I went with the forties because I ran a crest hoop, a stands crest hoop, which is slightly wider than your typical gravel rim that they make. It's about two millimeters wider. So I did get a slightly larger footprint, meaning where you see the tire hit the ground, it kind of widens out by a little bit. Um, mm. And I was able to rely on those crests a bit more just because th there's a, an extra layer of carbon there. Smart. Yeah. So slightly wider tires, is going to give you a little bit easier rolling on, on rolling over rocks and the mm -hmm. constant undulations in the surface that you're dealing with. That probably yep. helped a ton. It's clever. What sort of gearing did you run on the bike? That's another big topic of conversation because it's not flat. People think like middle America, Kansas must be flat, but I know it's, actually, do you even know how much you climbed over, over the course of this? Uh, it was a little over 20,000 feet. Oh my gosh. So it's like, <laughs> it's death by a thousand paper cuts out there. Everybody wow. just, does, yeah, you're right. Everybody assumes Kansas is flat as paper, but I mean, there's really no sustained climbing out there, but it's just as undulating terrain. Um, I went with my GRX DI2 setup with a four a double in the front. So a 48, 31, and then the rear, I ran an 1134. So I had plenty of climbing gear, especially late at night when I wanted to spin a high cadence up there to save the legs. And then, yeah, plenty of gearing on those dirt roads to, to get in the 4811. I think that's kind of smart. It's nice to have the two by up front in this case with the tighter cassette in the back too, I would imagine, because since you're constantly dealing with undulations, I bet you shifted a ton, you know, just nonstop you were shifting and having bigger jumps in between gears could be a pain to deal with. Absolutely. And that's one thing that I pay attention to is trying to avoid climbing up those hills at like 55 RPM because you're just mm. burning those muscle fibers that you're going to, going to wish you had at our 16 or whatever. So trying to spin <laughs> 16, uh, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> spy, trying to spin a high cadence will save energy in the long run. So mm. for me, a double is the way to go. Double chain. Yeah. Did you do anything else unique to your bike? We talked about the frame bags and the red shift uh, stuff that you changed around the gearing tires. What else did you do that was unique to set up your bike for this? I ran the red shift kitchen sink handlebar as well. Mm. Uh, it's this really funky looking handlebar that has a wide flare. Um, and it also has, it doesn't have 
arrow bars per se on it, but it does have a, it's a one piece handlebar that flares out in the front. So it gives you a different hand position. So I think we mm -hmm. counted something like seven to eight different hand positions on that particular handlebar. Oh, nice. So it really just gives you the options. And if I could say one thing to anybody who wants to do these races where you're out there for anywhere from four hours and above, my opinion is always go for comfort. Don't necessarily think of weight, think of comfort because inevitably comfort equals speed. And there's nothing worse than being out there and just being uncomfortable from the start. So that was really where I made the decision of, yeah, let's go with the suspension seat post, the suspension stem and that redshift kitchen sink handlebar. It, it looks different and it's, it's rather untraditional, but yeah, like I said, comfort was at my forefront there. Yeah. Did you do anything with like wrapping your bars with like extra padding or anything else? I've seen some people do that. So that's, what's really cool about the, the redshift handlebar is where the drops come down, there's this ergonomic end to them. So rather than just being your typical drop handlebar where you just have one handle position, there's, I'm sure people have seen ergon mountain bike grips where they have this mm -hmm. palm padding. They have that both on the drops and on the tops. So you're really oh, able cool. to change things up and reduce any numbing in the hands and have a lot of not necessarily compliance, but just padding on your hands out mm. there. And that I was extremely happy to have that. I, I wish I counted how many times I was switching my hand positions out there. <laughs> Probably yeah, as much sure. as I was shifting. <laughs> <laughs> how much, what about kit? Uh, you, I, I saw you had a white Jersey on, I assume that that was intentional due to the heat, but what, what, how did you decide? Let's go head to toe. How did you decide on what to use? So I'd recently switched over to Velocio apparel, uh, I've always really, awesome I've, I've looked up to those, those guys for a long time. The company as a whole is just phenomenal and what they do for the industry. And, um, I chose the white, it's called the radiator mesh Jersey. So you could basically get sunburned through the Jersey. It's that breathable. <laughs> so I went with the white Jersey just because I am from Phoenix. So I know the benefit of wearing lighter colors versus dying a thousand deaths in the sun out there. So I went with the, the radiator mesh Jersey. They also make a Lux bib short, which is incredibly comfortable to me. Uh, I don't really get any slipping and I get a good, good amount of compression in that bib, which in the long run compression is a big benefit in my opinion. Um, I also went with white socks too. I'm sure people ask like, what are you doing with white kit out there? But there was a reason behind that for sure. And it was to, you're exposed to the elements out there. There's not much shade. You're just out in the open. So anything I could do to help cooling, I went with. Mm. Did you, uh, for your shoes, what did you use there? I used my, I always run my Shimano uh, XC9s, a mountain bike shoe, yep. both on gravel, road, mountain. I just like to keep things even across the board. Uh, yep. It's the one shoe that I'm able to spend long, long hours in and not get any numbing in my feet or anything like that, reduced hot spots. And shoes are such an important choice, regardless of how long you're out there, because you can lose a lot of efficiency with a shoe that flexes a lot, obviously. And that can create so many hot spots in your foot, which I used to have shoes a long time ago that weren't so stiff. And there'd be mm. times where a day after a long race, I had a hard time walking because of hot spots. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about such long events. And I know some people have, uh, tried to show up with road shoes to unbound gravel before. It's kind of like a flex to be like, I'm not planning on walking at all. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, that's a bold flex to make when those rocks are out there waiting for you. Uh, yeah. what you mentioned that you had solid foods as well. What sort of solid foods did you have with you and what did you end up eating? What didn't you end up eating? I ate, so I, I brought everything. Um, the one thing that stuck out to me was when we got to Kansas, we had heard that, uh, the Oreo brand cookies had come out with a true gluten-free Oreo, Oreo cookie. And I was Ooh. like, Ooh, we, I love Oreos, but I can't eat them. Cause I, I can't have anything with wheat or gluten in it. So we went to Walmart and bought a pack of gluten-free Oreos. Uh, <laughs> I brought a handful of those with me and those were the first things to go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I also brought 
there's these beef jerky sticks that I bring that are really satiating to me. There's a lot of sodium in them and they really curb hunger. So I went with that. And I was always running infinite liquid nutrition in my bladder on my back. And that I got so into finding out how many calories I would need on this ride. I actually did a test where it sounds kind of gross, but I would drink from the bladder at home and I would spit it in a, a measuring cup to find out how many calories I would be getting per two sips of my bladder on average, because it's really hard to monitor how many calories you're getting from a hydration pack that has a concentrated mix in it. So it was, mm. I found it really important to know for every sip out of that bladder, roughly how many calories I was getting. And I think that that was a really, really crucial thing. Cause what you're not just going to use. I went with an Osprey, more of a vest, uh, mm -hmm. and it had pockets in the front, which was super nice, but also plenty of storage in the back. So it wasn't a true running vest. I wish I recall the name of it particularly, but it was a lighter, lighter weight vest. And it was, I had a 50 ounce bladder in the back. Nice. Did you have to make any, you mentioned the gas stations. Did you have to make gas station stops? And if so, what did you get at the gas stations? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the gas stations were, I was worried about that in the start. I had spent a lot of time looking at the cue card mm. and really kind of planning out what gas stations I wanted to hit and which ones I didn't want to hit. Uh, luckily the group separated after the first gas station. So it wasn't as chaotic running in, getting what you need and waiting in line. That was what I was most concerned about, right? Because if you're not strategic on getting into the store first, the person who leaves first knows that you're still waiting in line. And so then they can <laughs> take <attack>. off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I had, I had done a lot of practice in my training of going into a gas station and looking for exactly what I wanted and what I needed. Hmm. And in all honesty, I focused more so on liquid calories from gas stations than any solid calories. So it's not the healthiest thing, but I was relying a lot on soda out there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's quick sugar. It was satiating because it was warm out there. And, and I mean, what's better than a Coke when it's hot out. Right. Mm, so, right. uh, for example, though, at the last gas station, which was probably, I'd say two and a half hours from the finish, it was getting pretty hot at that point. So I, I pulled in and I drank two Red Bulls, a strawberry milk, two sodas, a Gatorade and two bottles of water all within like five minutes. Whoa, that's a trained gut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and I felt that like, I, I felt that right when I hopped back on the bike, but within 20 minutes to 30 minutes, it was, my gut felt pretty good. And wow. I contribute that to definitely training the gut, right? Because if I had all of a sudden shocked the system with all of this sugar and all these calories, it could have come up the other way or yeah, it just would have been a lot of discomfort. What did you use for your head unit? And, uh, and did you have to plug in external batteries or anything? Yeah. So I used the Wahoo Rome element Rome computer. And I, another thing that I did is I actually brought two of them. I have two of those computers and your GPS unit is basically your lifeline out there. If you lose your GPS track, you might as well call in and get picked up out there because the roads just aren't marked. And there's so many crisscrossing roads out there in Kansas. So I, I said, I'm going to bring two just to be safe. I also brought an external battery pack, which was like a, a 5,000 milliamp hour, I, I, whatever they call it, a 5,000 power bank. Uh, mm -hmm. My battery, I did plug it in for a couple hours towards the end. And then when it was plugged in, I kept it on and I put it in my top tube bag. So it would continue recording. And then I turned on my spare ele element room GPS and put it mm -hmm. on the top. So I was at that point I was running two GPS units and I just cycled them through because I think I got like roughly 20 hours of battery life on the one. So I just wanted to make sure it was topped off. Clever, smart, smart system. What about lights? Cause you started, I think at three in the afternoon, local time there in Emporia. Is that yep. right? And then, so you rode through the night and then finished the next afternoon. What did you do? Was there a light on your bike and on your head? And if so, which models? Yeah, I ran a light on the helmet and on the bike. Uh, I 
switched to exposure lights back in 20, at the end of 2018. And for a particular reason, what's really cool about those lights is the battery pack is built in internally. So you're not dealing with external wires or cords or anything Mm -hmm. like that. And it's also a strong light in the sense that I can program it on the little LCD screen on there. And I got 12 hours of battery life on the light on the bike. And then I was, I brought, so that was the exposure six pack light is what they call it. Uh, And then I ran the exposure Diablo on the helmet. It's a really, really compact light. And I ran, I brought two of those with me and I ran those on the six hour settings each. So I just had to swap. I had to stop one time to swap lights on the helmet. And other than that, the, the light on the, the handlebar ran the whole time and it was plenty of light. I didn't need any more or any less. So let's talk about your pacing plan then. Like you mentioned that your goal was to just finish, but did you have any plan like keep heart rate within here, power within here or speed within a certain point? Or was it like time-based checkpoints? How did you work that out? Yeah. So I, in training, I'm very meticulous about heart rate and power. I actually really, I love looking at those metrics in training. However, in these longer races, I don't look at power. Uh, because inevitably the power numbers are going to drop throughout the race. Mm -hmm. And I have found for me personally, that seeing those metrics start to plummet actually can play tricks with my mind. And I, I kind of beat myself up over that. So in these 24 is a lot of times I just go off of heart rate, but for this particular race, I didn't look at any metric other than my little dot moving across the map. That was the only thing I wanted to do. I just went off of feel from start to finish. Mm. Uh, if you use a power meter and heart rate monitor enough, you can, you can really be in tune with your body. And I think it's really important that people do that rather than just always staring at a screen for one, it can be dangerous. Cause I can, you can catch yourself just looking down at the screen, especially if you're riding through towns where there's traffic, mm. but two, it, I just don't want to have to rely on a certain number in a race. Um, So for me, I went with the approach of, yeah, just go off of feel. If you're breathing too hard, back off. If you're not breathing hard enough, then maybe go slightly harder. Yeah. Did you have any dark points, uh, out there where you were, where you had felt like you had lost the plot or where things were going sideways? (laughs) I'm sure. I mean, it's so long, you know, you have to have something. Yeah. 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 I think everybody would lie if they said they didn't have those moments. Uh, Mm. I, I always give myself this rule of there's going to be times where you're going to feel like garbage for an hour. And so allow yourself an hour pity party out there, allow yourself to feel like junk for that hour. And inevitably that turns around. And when you're going through those low points, focus on the things that you can control, such as eating and hydration and inevitably a good snack out there will turn things around. And it's not going to happen right away, but if you're patient with it, it'll come around. While I was out there and I experienced some mechanicals, I really tried to stay patient and calm in those moments. I will admit that I was having some mechanical issues uh, about five hours from the finish that I was getting real. My temper was kind of getting the best of me there just because I really didn't know where I was on the Mm -hmm. course in terms of how, how far how far up am I? How far back is second? I just didn't really know to be exact. Um, Mm -hmm. so I did get a little frustrated there at the end dealing with, with some issues, but everybody deals with something out there, right? It's just, Mm. it's how you approach it. It's, it's not rushing the situation because we all know if you're out on a ride and you stop to fix, fix something, if you're flustered, you can, you can skip a step. And that can cost you more time in the long run. So I really tried to remind myself of that. But yeah, you mm. you inevitably go through dark moments out there for sure. You just you're questioning what am I, what am I doing out here? You know, like we've been riding for ten hours, and how the heck am I supposed to ride another ten to twelve, sometimes fourteen more hours? It's it's not easy in any anyway. Yeah, no doubt. I, what an accomplishment, man! It's so cool to to see that you were able to complete this race. And then to see that you were able to win it is just an, a cherry on top. And actually, as I had mentioned to you just before recording, 
when I saw that you were doing Unbound XL, I was like, oh, we got to have Taylor on the podcast <laughs> to talk about this. Um, and, and then when you won it, I was like, oh, cool. We get to celebrate it too. It's just, it's just incredible. Uh, I appreciate such it. It's a huge amount of, yeah, of admiration and particularly Taylor, this is particularly poignant because this year, when you mentioned that you, they, they had to cancel 24 hours in the old Pueblo. And then you had that huge, and then you had the huge crash, but then leading up to that, the, you know, the prior year you had gone for the record of 21 laps at 24 hours in the old Pueblo as a solo rider, mm -hmm. which, uh, having done that event, I can't fathom that that is incredible to do that many laps, uh, or to even get to 20 laps to do more than 10. It's incredible. Um, it's just crazy, but you, and you've mentioned this and you've really shared a whole lot of your experience with this. You've struggled with mental health issues while being an endurance athlete. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people listening to this right now probably have as well. I have myself. Absolutely. And the hard thing, a lot of the time is we feel like endurance sport is the antithesis of mental health issues. It's about enduring, pushing through hard things and coming out the other side. It's about kind of like, uh, overcoming the very thing that's there. And we feel like maybe that endurance sports helps up, helps us run from it, mm -hmm. but maybe it doesn't. And I just want to take some time to talk about this. Um, how have you, or what have you learned in the past year about mental health and endurance sport and their relationship? That's a huge question. And this can probably fuel quite a conversation for us to have, but, but what yeah. have you learned this year that you would want to share with us? Oh man. It has been a journey to say the least. Um, I have gone through, and I kept a lot of this personal up until recently. I've gone through a lot of stuff since I, since I can remember. Uh, really, the only person that knew about it was Mary, my wife. I was just, I was nervous about telling people because I had a lot of, I had at times some pretty personal dark things going on in my life, and I didn't want to scare people. I didn't want people to look at me differently. I didn't want to that attention around it. And I think that a lot of people find themselves in that situation, right? They, they keep quiet about it. And I, one thing that I learned by speaking up about it is it, is it made me feel a lot better and not alone. Uh, I always felt like this black sheep when I was going through these issues. And there were a couple lar alarming moments where if I didn't speak up, I think it would have, there may have been a different story here. Um, and luckily I have the support in Mary where she, she didn't, she wasn't alarmed in the sense of, uh, freaking out in the moment. She was very cool, calm and collected. Um, and she approached it from like more of a medical standpoint, which I'm super grateful for. And I am beyond thankful that I do have that support system. And what really breaks my heart is I do know that there's a ton of people out there I don't have that support system. And like you said, I think that's where we see this, this correlation with endurance sport and people that struggle with mental health. Um, because for me personally, the bike is this form of meditation and it's a way that I can kind of work things out in my own head. And people out there, I think do the same thing, but they never really, they just, they just never talk about it. And it's this, it's like that thing. If you have this almost like when you get angry and if you, if you let it boil, let it boil, it's eventually going to come out and it, it really scares me. And it, it makes me, like I said, it breaks my heart to know that they, some people just don't have support and mm -hmm. there is support systems out there for you. I was in that same boat of not trusting anybody and, and telling them. And, and finally, when I, started seeking out professional support just this year. I couldn't believe how many people out there were willing to offer a helping hand in the form of family, friends, people I didn't even know reached out. And so they were going through the same thing. Then you go to doctors and they're just willing to help. Right. Mm. And I had grown up going to doctors for some of these issues and I lost trust in them. I always felt like I was being treated differently. And so I rebelled against them. Um, sometimes it led to arguments in doctor's offices. I just, I wasn't in a healthy space. And so I just hope that people out there know that there is support, 
whether it's messaging a stranger on a social media app and just asking to talk about things that can make a huge, huge difference. It doesn't matter how big or small you think your issue is, your issue matters 100%. And so, yeah, mm. uh, reaching out for help, in my opinion, is the, the, the first thing to do. It's extremely difficult to do that, but it makes a difference. Yeah. Well, have you, so sometimes the bike, like you said, it's the form of meditation and it's the thing that can help you unravel the string, so to speak, many times when life itself kind of tangles it all up. But there are times when the bike in and of itself also just kind of like pushes us further along that darker path. Like you had mentioned with 24 hours in the old Pueblo, you were so hyper-focused on this goal and you had a great preparation coming in and, and you were executing and then things went sideways and kind of went off of that. Mm -hmm. I imagine that getting back on the bike wasn't helpful for you like immediately thereafter, right? After, after that. Yeah, so, you're totally, you're totally right. How have you managed that? Especially because it's your profession. Your profession is you're, you're, you're a bike racer. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage that relationship since the bike is your meditation, but then at the same time trying to offset it, does the, do the other approaches kind of take the place of the bike for you when you talked about seeking help and, and managing that? Or is there something else that you've found to be helpful? Yeah. I, I can only speak for myself, but for my particular story, I, for the longest time was using the bike as the only form of medication. Right. Mm -hmm. And there'd be times where I'd put so much, so much expectation on myself that it turned from a health, healthy outlet to an unhealthy outlet. And I was doing it for the wrong reasons. And when I was able to understand that I was doing it for the wrong reasons, it made riding more fun for me, more enjoyable, uh, not always being so obsessed with a result on paper. It's more about the process from start to finish. I think everybody that listens to the train road podcast loves the training aspect of riding, right? That is the fun part. That is what we get to do every day. And we're so lucky to be able to go do that. And once it starts to once the fun is taken away, things for me started to, to snowball, um, mm. not just in, in my active life, but also my personal life and everything like that. So it is easy to think that the bike is a healthy outlet, but then you, you put these expectations on yourself and this pressure, this continuous pressure to always nail a workout or nail a race. And that's just not realistic. It's not, mm. we're human, right? We're going to come up short. And I'm not perfect still. I don't have it figured out in the sense that if I do come up short, I'm not going to beat myself up, but it's a work in progress for sure. Mm. What do you mention the expectation side of things? And that's something that, uh, I think, uh, there's a temptation to think that mental health issues are in some way genetic or something else. And they're just nascent kind of like natural to a person. And that's what they are. And, and perhaps ignore the fact that we can put so much pressure on ourselves that we can absolutely harm our mental health. Mm -hmm. the expectation side of things, how do you manage your expectations with events? You came into DK it's or uh, I'm bound, forgive me with what seems like a very healthy perspective on what you wanted to achieve, but, but how do you manage that with expectations? That's tricky, particularly once again, when you're a professional athlete. Yeah. I, I wish I had the answer for it, honestly, because mm. this year has been so trying for me, um, from a mental health standpoint that that's kind of why I just took this approach with unbound Excel was I just wanted to go there and experience the event, have fun first and foremost, have fun before, during, and after. And I checked that box. I had a great time with Kenny and Mary flying there. Um, the, the, the rec family that hosts us while we're there is there's some of the most genuine down to earth, kind people. We just enjoyed our whole time there. And when I was able to focus on that, like, it's not just about the bike race. It's about the entire experience. It made it more fun for me. Mm. And that's when it, it seems like you, I perform better when I'm focused on having fun rather than being overly serious or focused on a result on paper. Yeah. What, what advice did you give to athletes that are struggling with mental health issues right now? Your your issue is important. I always thought because I didn't go any through anything traumatic in my life 
And I always assumed that there needed to be this extremely extreme traumatic experience that that's not the truth. Um, some people have anxiety and depression and it doesn't matter if you think it's not important and you want to just push it under the rug. It is important. And there are people willing to listen to you and people will hear you out and they want to help you. Um, I understand, like I said, it can be the most terrifying thing to talk about this, but once you, once you do it for the first time, it becomes easier every time thereafter. Uh, and you're not a black sheep. I remember being at doctors in back in March in a place that I never want to go back in tears and just saying, I am a black sheep. Like I, what is wrong with me? And they cool calmly and collectively just said, like, there's a reason for this. We can help you. We can fix this issue. We can help, help you treat this issue. You don't have to live your life like this from now, for now, from now on. And in that moment, it was really hard to believe them and hard to see it. But now I am seeing it and I'm trusting that process. And so I just hope people can, can take that step um, of reaching out for help first and foremost. And uh, don't be afraid to, to, to alarm somebody with, with your issues, because if it is the right person, they'll approach it in a, in a calm way and, and not make you feel like an outcast. That's awesome. Taylor, thank you so much for doing this. Um, hopefully Lynn listening to this, it's given a bunch of people aspirations and insight into unbound and in all its various forms and, and different tips that you can do, but then also how all of us can achieve uh, a healthier balance with mental health, our, our participation in endurance sport, which is such a, a demanding thing. Uh, just a super great conversation. You're awesome. I, Taylor. I appreciate it. Oh man. I appreciate it. And like I said, train road podcast is one of my go-tos every Thursday. So, uh, I appreciate you having me on and, uh, it really means a lot. Yeah. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Uh, Instagram is probably the best way, uh, at T Ludeen. Uh, I, I do my best to answer questions on there or, or get back to people as quickly as I can. And yeah. And I'm always there too. If, if someone is struggling in a dark place, reach out to me, like, don't be afraid to just shoot me a message. And like I said, you may, it may be terrifying to do that. It, it may feel weird, weird at first, but I'll be there to chat with you. Uh, share my story if you want to hear it. Uh, yeah, let's, let's talk. That's awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Taylor. If you're listening to this podcast right now and you want to share whatever achievement you have accomplished, it doesn't have to be winning Unbound XL. It could be anything. Uh, whatever you've used Trainer Road to be able to accomplish, just let us know. Uh, we'd love to be able to share that story and help somebody else maybe achieve a different level of success or maybe the very same. And you can do though do so at trainerroad.com slash SAP. You can go there, submit your story and listen to all the other episodes that we've recorded, share them with your friends, do all that stuff. So thanks everybody for listening. And thanks a bunch, Taylor. We'll talk to you all soon. Thanks guys.